So you brought up uh, two different types of, uh, you know, types of uh, the ways that the insurance company will pay you back. First is replacement cost, which is the most common. And again, any anything, any large investment property or anytime there's a lender, the lender will always require replacement cost. Um, what replacement cost means is what it will cost to rebuild it, you know, in in the event that the entire there's a total loss, you have a let's say a ten unit multifamily. There's a there's a big fire or a big storm, and the entire building goes down. What would it cost to build an entire building from the ground up? That's replacement cost, um, which is obviously the best form of coverage because that makes you whole. It means essentially it gives you back the from a business model, gives you back exactly what you had prior. Welcome to Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Tali, where we focus on the deals. Our guests are real estate closers who will share in detail the whole process from finding a deal to closing it, as well as strategies and tips to help you do the same. Here is your host, Annette Tali. Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Deal Closers. I am your host, Annette Tali, and my guest today is Isaac Schwadel. Welcome, Isaac. Hi, Annette. How are you? Good to be here. I am super excited to have you. And, you know, Isaac has the record, the world record, on how many times we try to schedule this meeting. And for many reasons, and I would say 99% my fault, we couldn't meet until today. But I'm super excited to have you finally. And thank you for your patience. You know, it's been crazy lately. My pleasure. Happy to be here and happy. Happy, happy it worked out in the end. Absolutely. Uh, so today we have an amazing special edition of Real Estate Deal Closers. We're going to be talking about insurance when it relates to multifamily, small and large. So, but before we start, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Isaac. He joined Allsure in 2016 as an account executive and rapid admin. After two years, he made the change to broker to share what he learned with clients in a clear and concise way. Prior to All Sure, he was the director of development at Rogers Jewish Experience, where he helped the organization with general fundraising, event coordination, and providing an original twist to marketing materials. When he's not busy with insurance, uh, he likes to hike, work on home improvements, and reading. So welcome, Isaac. So tell me a little bit of how did you get into insurance? How did I get into insurance? Okay, um, it's not it's not such a glamorous story, but but it, uh, it is what it is. Um, like like you read, I was um, involved in fundraising for for a, a Jew, nonprofit Jewish organization. Um, you know, helping specifically at Rutgers University. Uh, helping uh, Jewish students there connect with their heritage and learning more about Judaism. Um, after a while, I was looking for, I enjoyed the connecting with people part, but I wanted something a little bit more, I guess, intellectually stimulating. So I moved uh, and an opportunity for, you know, uh, presented itself in the insurance world. Uh, I tried it out. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and like you said, I made the transition. I started in the back office where I really learned a lot about um, coverage, a lot about markets, and then uh, made the transition to, uh, you know, to a broker, which really brought everything together. I enjoyed meeting new people, talking to people, and um, essentially helping them with, uh, with whatever it is I can help them. And, this, you know, and the way it turned out was to help them with their insurance needs. Um, so that's the, the, the long and short of the, you know, of the story. Awesome, awesome. Real Estate Deal Closers, special edition. All right. So I think insurance is one of the subjects that, uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to understand how to get a quote because there's so many different variants when you get a quote. And, you know, sometimes when you get like two different quotes, they are not apple to apple, right? Like each, you know, uh, insurance agent has a different, um, approach to it sometimes they include one thing and then the other one doesn't so it's kind of hard to uh, compare apples to apples so let's talk a little bit let's focus on multifamily small and large and you know what are the the basic insurance um, that we need to look at when we're looking at this uh, quote so um, just 
generally when it comes to any type of real estate, no matter multifamily, uh, homeowners, there's always two parts of the insurance. There's the property part of a policy, um, it could be set up in two ways, but there's the property part and there's the general liability part. Um, sometimes it's the same carrier offering the coverages for both. Sometimes it's two different carriers offering uh, one for the property, one for the liability. Uh, the property side covers any uh, physical damage that happens to, again, on a homeowner's or your home in the multifamily, any physical damage that would happen to the actual structure. Um, for example, if there was a leak, if there was a hurricane, if there was, you know, what just happened now in Texas where they had the freeze and many, I spoke to many people there, you know, pipes. I was talking to an underwriter earlier last week and I, she was telling me that her kitchen was flooded. I said, oh, your pipe froze. She's like, I'm going on five pipes freezing. So when, yeah, it was not, not, a, fun, not a fun situation there, but um, any most occurrences, if something were to happen, a fire, uh, you know, pipe busting or things like that, and then there's physical damage to the actual structure, that is what the property uh, covers. Additionally, on the property side, there's many, um, like smaller or sublimits, uh, you know, minor things that it covers, but it's beyond the scope of, you know, of, of, a, of, a, of a short interview. But the other major point uh, factor that a property policy covers is in the case of multifamily would be loss of rents would be, um, let's just go back to that case. Uh, there was this deep freeze in Texas, a pipe froze um, and ruined two or three apartments. So besides for the actual repairs, the construction repairs that you're going to need for those apartments during the time that you're doing those repairs, obviously those um, apartments are not going to be up and running. You're going to be the, you know, the owner operator is going to be losing that, those rents. So that is also included um, in, the, uh, in the property part. The way the terms are, one is property and one is their business income or annual rents. That's the way that's referred to, but that's on the property side. And then the liability side, there is for any um, lawsuits that are brought against the owner operator, uh, which they are legally responsible. Uh, examples of that would be um, slip and fall. Uh, you're in Florida, you don't, you, you don't, you can't relate, but it does snow in other parts of the country. Um, we just had here, you know, here in the New York metropolitan area, we had, uh, you know, three, four weeks where there was a lot of snow on the ground, you know, we got the day after day, a lot of ice. Um, God forbid, and especially in, this is more, of a risk in a larger multifamily or garden style where you have you know, a large spread of, and a lot of sidewalk, a lot of people walking around. Um, somebody, God forbid, slips and falls, and the sidewalk wasn't treated properly or in any place in the country, whether there's snow or not, if you have broken sidewalk, somebody slips and falls and injures themselves, they will bring a suit against um, the owner operator. And that's what the liability covers. On liability, there's one more piece, which is uh, referred to either as umbrella or excess liability. And without going through the numbers, the basic concept of excess liability is that your what was what's referred to as general liability policy caps out at a certain at a certain limit. Um, let's just you know let's the normal is at at one million dollars per occurrence. That means if somebody slips and they hurt themselves very badly and they bring a lawsuit and they're awarded. $1.5 million, your pop, the general liability policy will only pay out to a million. Anything above that, um, either it's your responsibility and what most, what most um, owner operators will do and almost all lenders require is that you get another layer, what's called either excess or umbrella liability, um, which will cover that. So those are just the basic, very basic uh, coverages that exist when it, when it comes to um, any size, any types of property. There's the, the two exposures, the exposure of being sued uh, because of your negligence, and there's the exposure of your property, of, of loss of money, either because your property got damaged or because uh, you know, loss of rents and the like. Right, so how, how does the insurance broker determine the value to insure? Because you, know, you can, you know, you, I think you can do it based on the value of the building uh, or the replacement value. Can you talk a little bit about this? Right, sure. Okay, so um, there's an, you, you're, you're asking a great question. It's actually, it's two questions in one. Um, there's two, there's how you get to the valuation 
Um, and then there's the different types of, of indemnification, different types of ways the insurance company can pay you back. I'll, I'll answer that first, and then we'll get to the how you get the evaluation. So you brought up uh, two different types of, uh, you know, types of uh, the ways that the insurance company will pay you back. First is replacement cost, which is the most common. And again, any anything any large investment property or anytime there's a lender, the lender will always require replacement cost. Um, what replacement cost means is what it will cost to rebuild it, you know, in, in the event that the entire, there's a total loss. You have a, let's say a 10 unit multifamily, there's a, there's a big fire or a big storm and the entire building goes down. What would it cost to build an entire building from the ground up? That's replacement cost, um, which is obviously the best form of coverage because that makes you whole. It means essentially it gives you back the, from a business model, gives you back exactly what you had prior. You had a building with 10 rentals, you know, 10 units, you're, you have that back. That's why, again, that's why the banks want that because the banks, um, the lenders are always, you know, the, what, what they're lending against is the asset um, and the asset, they want the asset to get back to where it was. So it's, you know, so there's cash flow or there's you know, actual profits. So most lenders are going to require replacement costs. Um, in certain cases and for certain people, and depending on the person, um, there's another, there's actually a couple of other valuations. The other most common is actual, excuse me, actual cash value. And that what that means is, is that the, excuse me, is that the insurance company will pay the actual value of this, what the structure was. Um, so where, where this comes into play and where sometimes carriers will insist on that is when you have older buildings. Um, when the, so the, to re, you have a building that was built in 1900. So the actual, what, the actual you know, walls and wood and whatever's there is not really worth much. But to replace that, the, this, the difference between replacement cost and actual cash value there is, is significant. Um, so, some, so there, you, the, either you can take the option or sometimes, again, the carriers um, might insist that they're only giving actual cash value. But at you as the customer, or just so you know, what you're going to be left with is not not anywhere near the amount of money you'll need to rebuild what you had. Um, which means, again, you have this ten unit building. It's an older building. It's you know took a lot of wear and tear. It was built, say, built in 1950 um, with minor upgrades, and then again, you know, some sort of uh, ca catastrophic occurrence happens, and the entire thing goes down. Um, you're going to be left with just a fraction of the amount of money that what, what it would cost to actually rebuild that building. Um, so again, just a couple of things about that. Firstly, almost all lenders will frown on that and they, and they won't accept that because again, you're not going to be in a position if something was lost um, to rebuild what you had. Um, additionally, uh, this, and this depends on the carrier, um, if there's a significant loss, meaning if there's, you know, let's, for argument's sake, let's say the building is worth a um, million dollars and there's a, a large loss, 50, 60, 70, 100,000 dollars, different carriers will, will evaluate it differently, but there's a chance that they will not, they'll only pay actual cash value for that loss and you won't be able to repair the building. I mean, you, you can do it, but you're going to have to shell money out of your own pocket to repair the building because they're only going to provide actual cash value. So it's, it's, it's not great coverage. Uh, the flip side is, is because the insurance company is offering you less money, the premiums are lower. Um, so that's, if, if there's no lender involved, it's something that you as the investor um, or the homeowner, whatever it is, uh, have to take into account. Uh, one interesting thing that we have seen is a sort of a blend um, on older buildings or in older buildings, particularly in um, high uh, wind or hail areas, you know, the middle of the United States where there's, or, or it was the tornadoes and all, you know, all the, all these twisters, all these fun stuff. Um, there, a lot of times we'll have the carrier will offer replacement cost on the building, but maybe actual cash value on the roof uh, is something that's not super common, but something that we see, meaning some sort of combination. Um, in those case, in most of those cases, the banks will be okay. Um, but it's something to, you know, something to think about. And the reason why the carriers are doing that is because, again, the roofs are older. Um, they could, because they're older, they could incur significant damage in the event of, you know, one of these uh, uh, tornadoes or, or similar events. And then, um, 
excuse me, the, the, the insurance company does not want, the risk is too high. I mean, the chance of that happening is significant. They don't want to, uh, they don't want to take on that risk. They're only going to pay, pay for actual cash value. There is some sort of middle ground that some carriers um, offer, um, and it's, they refer to as functional building value. Um, what that means is, is that if, um, let's say you have a, a brick building, you know, 10 units, um, and somehow the whole building gets, you know, knocked down. Um, what the insurance company will do is they're not going to give you actual cash value for that building and then leave you with nothing. They'll, they'll give you enough money to rebuild a structure that can serve the same function of the building you had prior. So it's not going to be a brick building. It might be a beer bones uh, wood frame building, but at least you'll have a building that can have 10 uh, apartment, uh, 10 apartments, but it's not, that's not super common. Um, it's, you know, only certain carriers offer it. I've, you know, we have seen it, it does exist, but it's just sort it's like sort of a middle ground between actual cash value and uh, replacement cost. So, uh, so that's that. Then the, the second part of your question was, um, how do you determine what replacement cost is? So there's, uh, there's a, there's a, you know, the, the, the most, um, I guess, the cleanest way um, really is to find out construction costs in that locale. Um, and then for this particular meaning, if it's a brick building, obviously it's gonna be exp more expensive per square foot. Um, if it's wood frame, it'll be a little cheaper. And then do a little bit of due diligence and then figure out the construction costs and what, what would it, you know, in reality cost uh, for this building uh, to rebuild this building. Um, most of nine out of 10 times, again, when there's a lender involved, that will be on the appraisal. Um, but I, I will say that I have seen the appraisal is, uh, you know, there's a process and it's the, the, the bank, you know, most of the time they outsource it, but there are good appraisers and bad appraisers. I've seen some appraisals come in so terribly off, um, you know, that uh, you, you'd be surprised. But um, the thing with a lender and appraisal is that the lender will require you to cover whatever the insurable value comes out to be in the appraisal. Um, so if it, there's not really much wiggle room, unless you want, I mean, to go lower, unless you want to go higher, you want to be safer. But the minimum the uh, a lender is going to require is, um, you know, what, what comes out in the appraisal. The exception to that is, is not, not the exception. Some banks sometimes will only want their loan value, their loan amount covered. So let's say it's a 15, the building just to, to you know, throw out numbers, let's say it's a $15 million purchase of you know, a larger multifamily. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, the loan, or let me backtrack. Let's say it's a, the replacement cost for this large multifamily would be about $15 million. Um, you're getting it as a steal of a deal. Um, you're paying only $6 million. You put down however much you need for the down payment. The loan is, let's say, $5.5 million. Um, there are banks that would say, hey, all I want, all I need to see is insurance of, of $5.5 million and I'm okay because I know that I can get my collateral out. Um, it's, it's scary because as, as the investor, um, especially, and this I, I, I can't say this enough times, if you're an investor and you're investing your own money, you can make your own decisions. Um, if you're investing and you're a syndicator and you're investing other people's money, it's always important to uh, consider that other people might be more averse to risk than you are. And um, just for selfishly, for your own reputation, if you underinsure and you cut corners and then you know something were to happen, it, you know, you, you're going to be, you're going to have to go back to your investors and say, hey, um, you know, we try to save another five or six thousand dollars on the insurance policy, so we underinsured the building, and this is what happened, and now we're we're stuck in a bad situation. Um, so, when you have that situation where the bank is not requiring the full replacement cost value. Um, and it's obviously it's a business decision, uh, it, you know, as, as the investor or as a syndicator, but it's definitely something to consider that, or something to to at least note that the what the bank is requiring is sometimes really completely off from what the actual replacement cost is. And the reason why the bank doesn't need the entire replacement cost is because they're only looking out for the amount of their loan, and that's all they care about. But you, as the investor, um, you know, you you can be in a bad spot, and then. 
it, it can play out in so many different ways because you know a lot what a lot of investors um, sort of sort of going into your territory, but what, what the game plan for a lot of investors are is they'll buy let's say an underperforming property and then for about a year or two you know fix things up, increase the rent roll, and then refinance you know and then be able to take out more money. But if in the event again something were to happen, so your whole business plan is really not for the value today, but the value in the future, and then you really. Uh, by not insuring the insuring it properly really you know blew that whole plan apart so having it adequately insured i'm not saying you have to go crazy but when, when you see the numbers of the bank try to see if that's a number that makes sense that can actually you know replace the replace what exists you know again depending what your game plan is but have a plan know what it is and know if the numbers match that plan is i guess the best way to say absolutely. that absolutely i think that you know in many cases, the banks are more restrictive to what you would do. I know on a personal note, you know, on when I bought my six units, the bank required me a lot of insurance. And when I was doing the paperwork, I'm like, oh my gosh, why are they asking me for so much and blah, blah, blah. And then I got sued. And thank God for the bank that required me that insurance. Exactly. So please, exactly. you know, especially liability. If you don't have liability insurance on your properties and you're renting them, make sure that you carry it because that oh, saves, saves me from a sure, big, sure. big chunk of money. Um, exactly. It, uh, especially on the smaller, it, 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 it's the irony is, excuse me, that on that on the smaller properties, people so often think, ah, you know, I don't really need it. But there, the margins are so small. In other words, on a, on a real, on a, on a $5 million uh, real estate purchase, if somebody slips and falls and they sue you for five, $600,000 and you're not adequately insured, it's not. It's obviously not a good situation, but the as, the asset has enough enough value to pay for that and still exists. If you have, like you said, you know, six unit or seven unit where the whole value is, you know, can be under a million dollars, and you have somebody or one or, or two or you know a lawsuit, you could really be lose the entire asset. And I would go a step further: is that if something's not even your fault, if you have, I have a client that um, for whatever reason they weren't on top of their the tenant's insurance, and one uh, one of the tenants had a German Shepherd, and it, the, uh, another one of the tenants invited some guests, and then there was a, the dog bit the guest, and there was a tremendous lawsuit. Um, so in that case, so the tenant didn't have proper insurance, and so then the case comes to the owner, and if you're not properly insured, again on a smaller asset. The, the two things people don't realize. First of all, the settlements in these cases continue to rise. Um, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, and even if you are, you're able to settle uh, for not a, an amazing amount, um, or, you know, people, you know, I've had people say, oh, let me, can, can I make the tenant sign whatever it is, you know, that they'll never sue. Even if that, in which doesn't always hold up in court, but even if that does hold up in court, the defense fees and the, the time that this takes to, to play out, if you don't have proper insurance, you know, lawyer fees and, and, and adjust, there's, there's so many expenses that can be involved. It's just, it's never worth it um, to be, uh, you know, severely underinsured. You know, what, do you have to be overinsured? You know, different people have different, uh, have different uh, definitions, but to be severely or underinsured is, is, is always a risk because as much as we hope and pray that things don't happen, unfortunately they do. So yes, and uh, and you know and let me note that the insurance found us not negligent on my case and yet they came back for medical expenses and they got a big amount. Right. You know, and then my insurance probably will go up after that. Right. Uh, and you know that they proved that it was it was not my fault. It was not our fault. Everything looked good on our side, but still, you know, there is a lot of lawyers that will do the work um, and just charge them when they win the case, and they will go. You know, they don't care. They have big pockets. So especially like for like you said for small buildings, make sure that you have liability insurance, and you can buy if you own the place outright and you don't want to have property insurance because you don't want to at least have uh, insurance you can get like for a hundred dollars a year, you can get liability up to a million, you know? So it's not that expensive and it's totally worth it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, pets, you know, because like you said, you had a, a case of somebody and I also heard of a case where, you know, there was this, you know, duplex and they didn't have a fence and then a pet 
an animal from somebody else went to their yard and beat somebody and the owners of the, the property got sued even though the pet wasn't theirs and the guest wasn't theirs and they still got sued. So how do we navigate, you know, pets? And, you know, I know sometimes there are some restrictions about pets. Right. So, so that's, that's a great question. Um, and again, I'll, I'll answer, try to, to, to answer it fully. I'll, I'll break it into two parts. Um, there's from the coverage part, uh, I'll start first, is that there are policies. And what you were saying before about comparing apples to apples, um, there are policies, especially on the, from the carriers who offer on the lower end of coverage, meaning very, very basic coverage. One of the exclusions that they'll put on is a, an animal exclusion, which means that if any lawsuits are brought against the owner because of an animal, um, then they will not provide coverage. And again, whether it's your, like you say, whether it's your fault or not your fault, two things, uh, there's defense costs, which can be astronomical. And again, if it's a duplex, if it's a small, if the whole cash flow of the property is, is not that much, if you want to, if you're going to have to sink all that into defense costs, you're going to be in, in a bad situation. So sometimes it's worth it to invest you know, a little bit over time. If you look at you, you look at it as investment over time um, into that, you know, defense fund, if you want, that in the event that something will happen, um, you'll be properly covered. So it's an important exclusion to look out for. Um, and once we're talking about exclusions, I'll just talk about two or three other exclusions, which are very important um, to look out for on multifamily. And one of them is firearms exclusion, which um, depending on where the asset is, um, is it either an issue or not, but on, in, high, in zip codes with higher crime scores, carriers will put that on and it's important um, either as an investor or to review it with your broker, make sure that you have that either removed or try to remove it. Sometimes they won't and sometimes there's not options, but- so Meaning that they include? Exclude, meaning that if there, if there's a, a lawsuit brought against the owner, um, let's, let's just play it out. You know, if there's, if it's a high crime area and somebody shoots somebody and they get hurt or die, whatever, you know, they get murdered. And then almost always, whenever someone gets hurt, there's a lawsuit. Um, almost always those lawsuits end up at the landlord, whether they did the right thing or not. Um, and it, it ends up, you know, it, against you. Uh, if there's a firearm exclusion, your, your policy, your insurance company will not provide defense. They won't, will not provide coverage for defense costs and will not provide the uh, coverage for whatever settlement, uh, you know, the court decides or you know, whatever, you know, the parties decide outside of court. Right. So basically you want to remove that exclusion. You want to make sure that that exclusion is not included not there. in your policy. Exactly. Uh, another exclusion is a, the two that are really the same is the, what we refer to as abuse and molestation and then there's assault and battery, which are all in the same thing. Again, if, uh, and, and we, we have a client, again, who, who had this, one of the reasons why they came over to our firm is because they were gotten into a bad situation um, in a building in, uh, in, in Brooklyn, in New York. They had um, an unfortunate story that one of their tenants was raped in the hallway and the lawsuit was brought against them. And they unfortunately had this um, the abuse and molestation exclusion, and they were in a whole host of trouble because they did not have, uh, you know, did not have proper coverage. Um, Assault and battery is similar. If there's a fight and people, you know, people get hurt, the, the bottom line is uh, the unfortunate truth is is that whenever something bad happens, there's always lawyers, you know, hovering around and they're always talking to people and they're always offering, like you said, they have big pockets. They they and the people accept it because it's no no money out of their pocket because they only pay them. They only, you know, take a cut if they win um, and. It, it, it can really put you, set you back and, and, and put you in a bad situation. And again, if you're dealing, if it's a small property and you own it outright, you, you can risk, you know, the asset. If you have investors, you know, there's someone you have to turn around to and explain to them why you don't have coverage. So it's always important, um, like just to go, keep going back what you said before, to make sure that when you're, when you're comparing quotes, or even if you're not comparing quotes, to have a good understanding about what is covered and what is not, co you know, what is not covered. It's worth it for you to take the extra 10, 15, even half hour, uh, review the policies on any, on any asset with your broker, um, and they should, you know, be willing to, uh, be willing to do that for you. Um, and, what I've realized with my clients is what I what I try to do, and over time, they they know what questions to ask, and 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 they also build you know the, they build the trust, and they know I'm not going to even the, if we couldn't we can get a policy for a little bit cheaper. Sometimes you know I'll discuss it with them, but 
they, th that level of trust exists, and I'm not going to sell them something that you know that would that can harm them in the long run if, to save a, to save a few dollars. Uh, so th those are exclusions that are extremely important. And again, um, depending on where you're investing and the, the the asset class, the types of assets, the neighborhoods, um, the crime related um, exclusions are very very scary uh, because they can. They can be very costly, and if you don't, and if they're there, then you don't have any coverage. And again, um, uh, you know, animal exclusions could be the same. Um, then to go back to animals, um, and this is it, to turn it the other way from from the the, the landlord. Um, a lot of landlords uh, to restrict tenants to restrict tenants from having pets completely um, is a is a business decision. Some landlord, some people that I've worked with, um, and this is more on the larger multifamilies. Um, they try to not have pet, their pet policies that they don't allow pets um, for reasons other than insurance. But a lot of times, in a, especially the small apartments, you have, so have a small apartment and a big dog or a small apartment and seven cats. Um, the, the wear and tear on the apartment is, is uh, much, much more. It has nothing to do with insurance. But I mean, and for, there are people on the insurance and also just don't want to take the responsibility, um, especially again, on a larger uh, multifamily complex, there's a lot of people around. Uh, a lot of people needs a lot of guests and a lot, you know, different things going on. And, you know, if there's a, a playground, and th there's just so much that can go wrong, you know, even though, uh, you know, door, uh, doors are man's best friend, but it, it, unfortunately, there are, there are way too many stories. Um, and then you have these, you know, the, the oddball stories, but which we, where people have exotic pets, and snakes and different weird things that can also, um, you know, have not such great results. So some people completely eliminate pets. Other, again, this is depend on the region, the neighborhood, the asset class, but other um, landlords feel that they can't, they can't afford that. They can't say we can't have pets because you're limiting your, uh, your, you know, your, your tenant, uh, your tenant uh, pool by too much. So what they do is they limit, and this is um, a lot of insurance companies will ask about this if there's um, restrictions on breeds and sizes, which means um, I'm, I'm, I'm not- 25 pounds and under. Right, exactly, right. Um, and, and what I've seen is also um, what I see more and more common because people, you know, they want to be able to um, appeal to the pet owning demographic, but they also want to make sure that there's somehow balance is that they'll, there's pet fees, you know, you pay X amount extra a month or different sizes. I've even, I, I saw one place like a smaller dog, you know, the let, but anything above from five to 15 pounds is, is you know, as high as is, is, is a price. But what the insurance companies are going to ask are, are there restrictions on sizes and breeds, which is more, uh, more what they're concerned about. Um, you know, pit bulls, Doberman pinchers, the more quote unquote um, dangerous breeds. And I hope I'm, I'm not in, in insulting any, you know, dog lovers or dog owners, but um, it, the, the, you know, the, the facts are the facts and the numbers are the numbers that those dogs, unfortunately, um, I don't know if they bite more, but when they do bite, the damage is, is a lot, you know, unfortunately a lot more, uh, is, is a, a lot a lot more damage happens. So a lot of carriers will ask to see, or they'll, either they'll ask, they'll ask to see a copy of, of the dog policy um, to make sure that, you know, the, that exposure does not exist. So um, how does, how does uh, how, uh, requiring renter's insurance can mitigate this? Is, is, does it really help or? Absolutely, you know? absolutely. So. The bottom line is to just to go back to what you were saying before, or to talk about, let's say the case that I was telling you, this, this client of mine. So it was a complicated deal. So um, it just to, they weren't, they, they bought the asset, but they weren't managing it. And then they finally took over management. But during somewhat weird during the time, during that transition, when they weren't managing, they, they like I said, they owned it, but they weren't managing it. Um, the, the prior management company um, was not on top of making sure that they had renter's insurance. So the, again, just, there was a dog bite, a dog bite incident, and they were sued. The first question, so when you know, when they finally took it over and they were refinancing and they came, they, they were coming over to us, um, we submitted to the carrier. The first question, and, and like you mentioned, the carriers always want to see loss history or loss run. They want to see what, you know, how this property performed or and how this owner performed at this property. Um, and they say, why there's a dog bite. Does the, does the owner have dogs? Uh, you know, does the, the owner have, owner operator have dogs to the property? So we said, no. So they said, so why is there, a, why is the dog bite on their policy? Um, so it, it became, it got messy because 
they, what it shows is that they're not responsible in making sure the tenants have the proper renter's insurance. If the renter did have proper renter's insurance, what, hap- what would happen is, is the, even though the lawsuit would be brought against the tenant, against the landlord, the landlord would then say in the lease, uh, almost all leases, there's an indemnification clause or some, something along the lines that the tenant is responsible for any lawsuits that are brought against the landlord because of the tenant, you know, which is an example would be this. Um, and that's why they, they carry insurance, their insurance company would cover. So essentially the landlord's insurance would push the claim back to the tenant's insurance and it would be settled that way. Um, so that's, that, that's really, and that can, that can happen with anything, not just with dog bites. If somebody, um, you know, if you mopped your floors and, and whatever it is, somebody came in, and slipped on the floor in your apartment. And then, you know, that's obviously beyond the control of the landlord, not the landlord's fault. But if they're sued and the tenant doesn't have insurance, then, you know, it can become the landlord's problem. Um, and again, like, like you mentioned, fault, unfortunately, is not always uh, the determining factor. Insurance companies sometimes don't, they rather settle and you're like, hey, why are you settling? I'm not interested. Yeah. You know, in, in settling, it's totally not my fault. They're, for them, it's just the easier way just to settle and you know, to get to close the claim than to leave the claim open and lawsuits back and forth. So it, it's, it, it's something as an owner, uh, just like you said, it's, it's very, very important to make sure that your tenants have proper insurance and to stay on top of them and to, you know, when they sign the lease, um, I, you know, I, I know many owners who will not either not sign a lease or not give them the keys until they have a copy of the, of the declaration page um, and then stay on top of that. Put that either, either you have you know, a, a complex uh, 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 asset management system or set up or you, know, you could do a simple setup a reminder on your Outlook calendar, whatever it is, um, you know, that 30 days before this, uh, this renews or 15 days, you know, request, uh, request the tenant. And then there are... Um, in some, in some of the higher end buildings, we're involved in, in, in New York City in some really um, luxurious buildings um, on either on, on, off, on the office side or on the on residential side there, um, they actually find the, find the tenants or, or if it's a, a condo association, they find the unit owners uh, for every day or every three days that they don't provide proper insurance. So again, the, you have to know your clientele well, um, but you can be, even if you don't wanna actually charge them, um, you can you know, become a pain, <laughs> a pain in the neck and call them and email them until you have a copy of that because it really, really uh, can be uh, make it or break it. And again, um, you know, we, we hate to, to cast dispersions on people, but oftentimes the people are irresponsible about their, you know, letting their insurance lapse are also the types of people who, uh, for whatever reason, have, you know, claims happen and are irresponsible. And it's it just, uh, it, it becomes a vicious cycle. So it's really, really important to make sure that you have renter's insurance. All right. And just one more uh, in, sure. in, on this subject. What about pools? Because, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you have a house and there's a big yard, even though you don't have a pool, the tenant comes in and install a pool. And even though you heard on your lease that the pools are not allowed, how does that affect your policy and is there a way to protect yourself? So, so the answer is really, is really not. It's really the, the way to protect yourself is to enforce it and tell them, I know, I, I, I'm really sorry, but I really, we can't have a pool. There are, um, it, it's, it's difficult to know in, in, in the exact, every situation has to be evaluated, uh, you know, individually, but there is, there is, con, there is a concept that insurance companies, if, depending how it was presented to the insurance company, a lot of insurance companies will ask, is there a pool? And you as the, you know, as the owner, um, you know, with no honesty, you'll say there's no, there's no pool. And then you have no idea. This depends, you know, if you're managing it from afar, or even if you don't know, if you don't visit the property every day, um, could be that they, like you said, you know, it comes the summertime, they put up a pool and then a claim happens. And then the insurance companies will say, Hey, you know, we look at the application says no pool. Um, I'm not covering this because we said there's no pool mm-hmm. and now there is a pool. So it's really, um, I understand from the landlords and it can be tough, but uh, you really have to try is that if you say there's no pool and you made the rule to try to enforce it, um, how you can do that, you have to, have to talk to a lawyer. But right. can, uh, you, can you require them and is there uh, an insurance that they could buy? Or would like renter's insurance help 
for like yeah they years. they would have to dis- disclose it on their renters insurance that they you know that they that they own an op or you know operate a pool at the premises but again it's that that that's almost impossible i mean unless you're actually placing um you know the actual the renter's policy for them and having them pay for it it's almost impossible to make sure um that they answer all the i mean there's trust and obviously you want to trust them, but it's to be a thousand percent sure you never know. And even just to to go back to the renter's insurance, um, this is unfortunate, but the facts are, even if they were to give you a copy of the declaration, but you know, the page of the renewal and let's say three months in, you know, they're, they fall on hard times and they don't pay their bills. The way insurance works is, and this is one of the the blessings of the insurance um, industry is if you don't pay, you don't have so there's no such thing as owing an insurance company money uh, for an extended period of time. You know, you don't pay them, they send you a letter, and then there's no insurance. So as the as the owner, um, you could put in, uh, and lenders have it, um, that you can be notified, uh, notice of cancellation. But you have to make sure uh, as as the owner that you're, you're put in, and not every insurance company will do that. Um, so... You, you have to do the, you know, the best we can do is the best we can do, essentially, right? You have to try your hardest and then, you know. So you have to put, they have to put you as. as additional insured. Additional insured on their policy. Yes. To cover yes. yourself. Okay. Right. Yes, most renters' policies. Um, again, it, it depends how it's written. Depends on the carrier. There's a lot of. I don't want to say most because, uh, especially with renters, there's a lot of local carriers that I'm. I don't even you know all over the United States, small insurance companies that I'm not even familiar with. But um, some of them will include. If it's a renters' policy, they will include the landlord. You know, say whoever you're required by written contract as a landlord. Some will require to give the name and the entity name. Um, but yeah, it, it's. That should all be spelled out in the lease. Um, and again, you, you hope for you ask them for as many as much as you can, um, and you know hope for the best uh, that they, that they pay their bills and that and they're they're a, and they're they're a good tenant on every level. Absolutely. All right. Um, I had one other question that I wanted to go sure. over. Okay. Yes. Uh, loss. Uh, loss runs. Can you explain for people that don't know? What is it and how does it affect your insurance? Sure. So loss runs are also, are also known as loss history report is um, basically just that. Um, every property, every entity, um, it's, it's split up in two ways. Uh, it's actually changed recently. Um, it used to be that it was that the insurance companies would look at, the, at a specific entity. So, you know, let's, uh, you know, give an example. You have a Tully Investments, um, ABC for a particular property, um, and you own that property for three years. So the insurance company is going to want, and you're with insurance company um, A, and now, you know, you meet Isaac Schwadel. He's like, oh, I can get you a much better deal. Um, I'm going to go to insurance company B. Uh, the way insurance company B is how they're going to evaluate. So they're going to run a whole bunch of models and whatever it is on their end, you know, with all different things that I have no idea what they do, but they do what they do. Um, one of the things they take into consideration is how um, you as the owner, Tali Investments, how you operate. Um, some owners are responsible. And the second they hear that something is broken, they run to fix it. The second they hear there's a small leak, they'll fix it and there won't be any large claims. Um, if there's a, if, if there are, so what, what the insurance company is looking for is you as the property owner, how did the property perform under your watch, um, both on the property side and on the general liability side. If there's, so they're requesting a, a summary basically of any loss history that occurred at the property. So if they see that um, there's five or six uh, slip and fall, it's a small piece of property and there's five or six slip and fall claims that obviously says that either the, the side, you know, let's say it's the sidewalk. The sidewalk is very broken and we don't want to take that risk on because there's going to be more people. It says something about you that you're obviously irresponsible, that you know the sidewalk is broken and you're not fixing it. Um, and that's another reason why we don't want to take on this claim. Um, if there is um, a large water damage claim, you know, on the property side, uh, makes them nervous, you know, that they, they say that, hey, this building has a, uh, you know, has a, a propensity for big claims, um, you know, we're only charging you five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars for the insurance policy. If there's going to be another twenty five thousand dollar claim, we're not going to make any money. Um, 
So that's you know, a large claim. And then they look for frequency also. Is there a bunch of small claims? Was there five or six $10,000 claims? Obviously, something's wrong with this building. You know, with, where you see that pretty often, um, especially here in, in New York City, is on newer built, when a building is brand new, um, the sprinkler systems in the building almost always malfunction for whatever reason, I, I don't know. Um, and you'll see that on newer, but there are actually carriers who, for the, the brand new nicest buildings in the world will not take it the first or second year post construction because of you know because of water damage but uh the bottom line being is that the history of the building is indicative of how this building performs in terms of premium and just if, if you look at it on the insurance company they're always weighing what they're charging you versus what they have to pay out uh, you know they're in the business of making money so they want to make sure that the amount that they're charging you is, is justified. So if there's so a- How long do they look? How many years do they look? So that depends. So that de- really depends on the carrier. Um, some carriers will want, it depend, depends on two things actually. It depends on the carrier and depends on the size of the account. Um, some carriers will want three years, uh, you know, a three-year history. Some carriers will want five years. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dealing, I was dealing with a, with a, a large portfolio. Um, I was telling you earlier before we started recording, a large portfolio in New York City. Um, we're with a lot of buildings and there's a, a lot of things going on there. There they wanted seven years mm-hmm. of loss histories. They really, depending on how much they're insuring, they want to know, uh, you know what chances are they taking. Um, one other point that recently changed is on a new purchase, uh, it used to be, um, you know, if you were buying something brand new, uh, we told the insurance the insurance company new, it was a new purchase, and they said, okay, we don't need to see loss history because um, the previous owner is not an indication of how you know the new owner is going to perform. Um, that worked for a long time, but now insurance companies said, hey, right, there's two factors here. There's how the owner performs, but there's also how the building performs. Um, and so, a, on a new purchase now, a lot of care almost all carriers are going to want to see um, loss, a seller's loss history, which can become a real, real pain in the neck because not sellers, I mean, sometimes they're hiding and they don't want you to see. And sometimes it's just this, your broker is dealing with the seller's broker and the, and the seller, you know, the seller is uh, an absentee owner and they live on the other side of the country. And it just, it can become very, very, very difficult to get. Um, but, you know, so That's I just guess, the, the facts of the industry. Yeah, so I guess before the loss run was attached to you to when you had the property, but now they are attaching these loss runs to the property, so it goes with the property. Exactly. So it could be also, you know, listen, multifamily owners, when you are buying, you need to ask for that because that could affect the price exactly. that you are going to be getting when you quote the insurance. Right, absolutely. One other thing I want, I want to say also, um, just as not directly related to this, but what, to what point you're making is if you're buying a property, um, you know, sometimes when you, you do due diligence and you, you know, you, you're trying to figure out what the costs are. A lot of times people, you know, they'll look, they'll get a T12 or whatever it is, they'll get a budget and, and there'll be a line item for insurance and I'll say X, Y, Z and people accept it at face value. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen a number of uh, two, two scenarios. Number one is that it's just absolutely false. Um, you know, and it is what it is. Uh, so, and the second thing is, is that if you, especially, and this is more, um, more prevalent when you're buying, when on the larger multifamily purposes, uh, uh, you know, sites, where you're buying that from a, like a, a, a national or a, a really large owner. And there is what they have is called a master policy. So they're paying very little because they have, you know, 10,000 units across all over. So they're paying a much lower rate. And you're coming in as your, this is your only, property that you're insuring on this policy, the, you know, the numbers are going to be higher. So what I tell everyone, and I'll, I'll you know, say it to you and your, and, and your audience, ask for a copy of the current policy. Um, don't just trust the number that you're given. Ask for a copy of the current policy. What that also can give you, and just to you know, tie the whole, the whole conversation together, is oftentimes the, if an owner owns something for five, six, seven, eight years, and we were talking about valuation before, they can be using the valuation that their bank gave them seven years ago which is you know, perfectly uh, great valuation. But your bank now appraised it seven years later at, you know, the discrepancy can be, especially on a larger firm, it can be, let's say a million dollars more, $500,000 more. So using their number for insurance is not a, a good indication for you because 
your bank is requiring you to insure it at a higher value. So you need more insurance. So obviously, you're going to be paying a higher value. So getting a copy of the policy really gives you a lot of insight into a lot of different nuances in the prop, you know, in, in, in what's going on in the property and in the insurance costs. And again, sometimes it can be easy, sometimes it can be difficult, but it's something that you should really, really um, you know, I'll stay a little short of saying demand, but you should really demand that in, you know, in the due diligence process, or even if you don't want to do the due diligence before you close, before you go into contract, really get, you know, understand the numbers. And that's, it's, again, as the asset grow, the asset types that you invest in grow, the insurance the insurance costs grow and it's something to really keep in mind. Right. So as part of your due diligence, you need to ask for the copy of the insurance and the loss run. That yes. way you can, uh, you know, you can call Isaac and you can ask him, hey, I'm under contract for property. Can you give me a quote? And here's what they have. And then you can look at it and say, okay, this is underinsured or there is too much coinsurance or, you know, there's no liability, enough liability. And, you know, then you can decide what works for you. And also ask your bank, if you're financing, what are the requirements? Because, right. you know, you can quote it and do, do your due diligence and like have the same type of insurance. And then when you go to close, the bank is gonna tell you, no, we require 2 million instead of 1 million. Exactly. You know, then you have to requote. And it, it does take time. I noticed, you know, small multifamily versus large multifamily, uh, getting a, a price is, it takes a lot longer for large multifamily than a small multifamily. Absolutely, absolutely. The small multifamilies, most of them, uh, depending on which, on, on what type of agency you're using. Um, but I, I know, you know, with our agency, we have what's called, uh, we're directly appointed with a lot of insurance companies, which means, um, you know, I collect the information, I bring it to the back office, and then what they take that information, put it into a website, and it spits out a quote. On larger multifamilies, it's actually manually underwritten, which which means you, you have, there's a, you know, I don't have to go through the whole process, but there's a form, you send it over to an underwriter, they look at it, they Google, they, they really, really, you know, uh, look into what's going on. Um, and that takes longer. And, you know, and that it's just, a, it, it's, uh, you know, manually under and takes, a, it takes a, a, a lot longer to actually um, get a quote. But the good thing about that, what, what I like about that, and we're, um, we as an agency uh, use that, is to leverage our relationship with the underwriter. I mean, if, if you're just sticking it into a computer, you know, th there's not much um, of negotiations going on there. But if I know that, uh, you know, you, you tell me, you tell me, uh, you know, Isaac, I'm in contract. This is the number that I want to be at. Um, and then I go to the underwriter and he says, okay, here's, you know, he sends me the quote and I see it's higher than what you want. I can pick up the phone or I can send an email and say, hey, you know, can you come down? There, there's that back and forth exists. Um, whereas on the smaller ones, when you're, you know, when it's less manually written, even if it is manually written, being that the, also there, the premiums are smaller, there's really not so much room for, for negotiation. So, um, so that, you know, the, those are, those, that's just a little bit of a difference when you, you know, you're saying before, like difference between large and small. On the largers, the premiums are larger. When pre the, the bottom line is when premiums are larger, there's a, so usually someone to talk to on the other end, again, depending on, on who you're dealing with, uh, but any, you know, decent size experience agency should have a relationship with the underwriters um, to be able to negotiate. Sometimes they'll say, no, I'm not saying, you know, every time you're successful, but at least the conversation can be had. And the other thing is when premiums are larger, there's always, you know, there's more room to, you know, to, to negotiate. Um, another thing I'll, I would say, you said, you know, when you're in contract, um, a service or, you know, a favor, however you want to say that I offer to my clients is even prior when you're doing due diligence, you know, I have no problem. You, you, know, you can call me up and we would say, Hey, let's, you know, what, what do you, what do you think the insurance cost would be here? Or does this make sense? They, there's a number there. And it's like, does this make sense? Um, more than happy to help during the due diligence process. And again, it, it can, I don't, I don't want to say it can make or break deals, but I have been involved in deals where it has, you know, broken the deal because um, they thought something and it was, the, I'm thinking of a particular property, it was a, a very large property. Um, it was 400 units um, and it was like on two sides of the street. One side was completely vacant. The other side was was like barely, it was occupied, but not completely occupied. And they were doing, it was a complicated asset. And 
the what they were the insurance numbers they were using um, in their due diligence before I got involved was just regular occupied building uh, numbers, and it's just vacant uh, vacant uh, apartments are a lot more expensive. Construction is is you know when you're doing major renovations is also different. So it's if you have a relationship with a broker. Um, you know, call them up. If you don't make a relationship with a broker and have someone help you along. When... Yeah, and if you don't have a relationship with a broker, you can call Isaac and, yeah. you know, and he can help you. And I have to, you know, you know, when I uh, had, I was looking at a property, I was not under contract. I sent it to you and I asked you, can you give me a quick quote? Because I want to make sure that this makes sense, you know, right. and uh, he helped me. So absolutely, you got to have that, those relationships of people that, you know, you trust and that you can send them your, your deals and, and they can give you a quote because it, it will save, save you a lot of time with, once you have a real, you know, estimate, you know, of, you know, how much it's going to be. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Right. And one, and one other thing, I just, let, let's say in your case, um, so sometimes if you send me, we, we put it, we actually, we ran it through one of those automated systems and we were able to get a quote. Um, but what, what I said to you then, and I'll just say now, if if because we have both access, we have access, you know, as, as an agency, and, and I don't mean, I mean, we're we are a great agency, but a lot of agencies have you have access to the to the online portals, but you also have you know the human underwriting. Um, what that th- does is, especially in the due diligence phase, is I can get you a quote, and I can tell you you're not going to pay more than this. Um, I, you know, if it comes, when it becomes reality and you, you know, you're, you're in contract and you're getting close to closing, we obviously will go out to market and go to all the carriers and get you the best price. But when you're doing your due diligence, you want to know, uh, you know, a cap. So it's very, it, there is, a, there is a lot of use in that case for the, you know, the, the quick, um, the quick quotes, the, the quotes that you're able to, to do online in house, um, is that you can, you know, get those, you know, within pretty quickly and within a day usually, or sometimes even quicker, and then um, give the real estate owner, like I said, a cap, you know, you're not going to pay more than this and, you know, whatever, they can make their own decisions uh, based on that. All right. And then my last question. So I want you to go over a little bit about deductible and coinsurance and what's the difference. Okay. So, uh, the two two totally different things. Um, the doc will do deductible first because it's it's easier to understand. Um, deductible is simply um, on it can be both on property and liability. And what that is is essentially an amount that you have to pay out of pocket. Um, first pay out of pocket before the insurance kicks in. Um, so let's talk about it on the property side. Let's say there's a $5,000 deductible. So if there is a 10,000, let's say something happened and there's a $10,000 $10, worth of damage, the first $5,000 of damage, the insured is going, right, the, the owner is going to have to pay out of pocket. Anything above that, excuse me, um, then the insurance company kicks in. Most almost all policies will have that per occurrence, which means if you have 10 claims a year, um, every single claim, the first $5,000, you're going to have to pay out of your pocket and the insurance company is going to pay above that. Um, that's on the property side, liability side, the same thing. If you're there, we see it less um, and for much smaller amounts, but it exists. Again, if there's a lawsuit, someone slips and falls and they sue you, um, or there's defense costs, the first 100, 250, 500,000, whatever it is, Dollars, that's going to be the owner's responsibility. Anything above that, um, the excuse me, the you know the insurance company is going to kick in. Coinsurance has to do with our conversation at the beginning. It has to do with value. Coinsurance means that if the insurance company feels right that you are not uh, you're not insuring the the um, you're not insuring the property at a proper value. What they will do is put on a coinsurance clause. And what that means is, um, let's, the, one of the most common numbers is 80% coinsurance, which means that if the number that you're giving is, 80, is less than 80% of the actual value, um, then the, the insurance company is not going to, for any loss, right? Even a, not a total loss. Um, the insurance company is only going to cover uh, about 80%, depending on, on the math, you know, particularly, but they're not going to cover the entire loss. Uh, they're only going to cover within the ratio that you're, that you're, excuse me, that you're paying less than the actual value. Okay. So for I mean, example, you have a property that, you know, the value is 150, but you tell the insurance you want to insure only 100. 
Right. So that's less than 80%. So, so mm -hmm. you only want to insure, you only want to insure a hundred and that's less than 80% of the value. So what they're going to do is um, they're going to see what percentage of a hundred, a uh, hundred for a hundred of 150, what percentage that is. And then every loss uh, they're going to cover um, with that ratio, mm -hmm. which means, so you have a $25,000 loss. You're going to only get the same, the ratio of hundred to 150 for, to, to replenish that loss. So again, so you have the deductible, which is let's say 5,000. So that's out of the picture. And there's another $20,000 that if you had, if you were insuring it properly that they would pay, but what they're going to do is they're saying, since you're under insuring the building um, by X amount of percentage, we're every loss we're going to look at that you underinsured for that. And we're only going to insure the, the whatever percent it's hard to, it's hard to do because it depends on each building, but right. the bottom, but, but the, 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 the basic rule is, is whatever under 80, once you hit your under 80% or sometimes it's 90%, um, however low under that threshold you are, that percentage is how they're going to cover each claim. I think is, is the easiest, I'm trying to think the easiest way to say it, but that's, that's the way to say it. They're not going to cover the complete claim. They're only going to cover, um, part of it. And the reason is, again, uh, just to go back, because, you know, insurance companies are in the business of making money. Um, and if you weigh on the on property, the way it works is you pay per thousand dollars, uh, depending on the carrier, but there's, there's a rate for the value of what you're insuring. So obviously a million dollar building, you're going to pay a lot more insurance for the $150,000 building. So if you have a million dollar building, and you're only insuring it for $150,000, the insurance company is only collecting is collecting much less money than they should be. So then they're not willing to shell out for every claim that you have, every $10,000, $15,000 claim, uh, because that the money doesn't, it doesn't justify the amount of money they're making on your premium. So that's the, the long and short of, of you know, why they put on coinsurance clause. And then going back to lenders, a lot of lenders want the, the clause removed um, because again, it, it doesn't offer full indemnification, doesn't offer full, um, you know, doesn't help you with every loss completely. And, you know, that you can be left uh, in a situation where it's not fully covered and the asset is not brought back up to where it should be. All right, perfect. That's, that is pretty clear now. So make sure that when you get your quote, uh, look to see if there's a coinsurance. And then if there is one, that means that you are underinsuring. And no, no, no. It, it doesn't always mean you're underinsuring. If there's a coinsurance clause, you have to make sure, uh, well, just the, if the, that clause exists, you have to make sure that the value that you're insuring is in line with the actual value of the building. I mean, sometimes they'll put on a hundred percent co-insurance clause, which means that if you're, you have to insure exactly what the building is worth. If you're one dollar short, then this, you know, the, the, then they they start uh, giving you coverage less. The hmm. most common is eighty percent, which means they give you that extra that twenty percent to play with. But if you're only insuring seventy nine percent of the building, um, then that's going to affect and say, and they're going to say, oh, you're not insuring the building properly. Now you have to, you know, now we're not going to pay claims. Um, completely. We're going to pay based on that ratio. So if you have the coinsurance clause, make sure that the value of the building, um, the value that you're, you're insuring is, is in line with the actual value of the building. Okay, perfect. Thank you for clarifying that. And also thank you for taking the time to be here. And if you are enjoying this amazing show with ISIC, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and that you uh, go to iTunes and leave us a review. And where can people find you, Isaac, if they want to connect with you and they want to start working with you? Okay. Um, they can find me on LinkedIn, the way the way we connected, Isaac Schwadel. I'll just spell my name. It's I-S-A-A-C. And then the last name is S as in Sam, C-H-W-A, D as in David, E-L. I'm on LinkedIn. You can say hi. Um, you can shoot me an email. Um, my email address is... Um, the first letter of my name. So it's I, then my last name is S-C-H-W-A-D-E-L and at e Olshore. So it's the letter E, A-L-L-S-U-R-E.com. Um, and uh, I'm sure Annette will put it somewhere in the show notes as well. If you, absolutely, if, absolutely. Uh, we'll put it on the show notes. And thank you, thank you so much again. Thank you for being here and sharing so much knowledge. And uh, I'm happy that we finally were able to do this, do this show. Likewise. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. 
This was Real Estate Deal Closers with Annette Tali, brought to you by Tali Investments. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Our goal is to provide amazing value on your real estate journey. Connect online at www.taliinvestments.com where you can find this episode and more. Did you like this episode? Subscribe, like, and share.